Hello and welcome to this RYA webinar. My name is Andy Rice and I'm going to be your host for this evening. It's the third webinar that we've run and this time we want to explore something which is a continual debate in many clubs around the country. The overall theme is the future of dinghy sailing but this evening we will be looking into how some clubs have amended their regular club activity with the aim of boosting participation or membership. But first, before we get too far down the track, a quick sound check. So um, if you can hear us, please can you confirm that you can hear us by saying yes in the question box on your screen. And once we've got a sense that the technology is working, we will crack on. So thank you very much, folks. Um, so great. Um, we Let's get some introductions out of the way. As you can see, I've got a few friends around the table with me. Um, so this evening, we have Alistair Dixon, our RYA Director of Sport Development, Liz Russell of Russell Marketing, Marine Marketing and Consultancy Expert, Mark Jardine, publisher of yachtsandyachting.com and sailworld.com. Um, now, uh, we've got some others, but we'll introduce um, them in a moment. Um, Mark, if I can start with you, if I may, you touched on this in the initial presentation with regards to youth engagement. Can you give us a recap of some of what you were talking about, Mark? A lot of what we were discussing then was about youth racing becoming far too serious. And what we think the focus should be is on the fun elements and making sure that those early years when people are first engaged with the sport, it's not too serious, they enjoy themselves and they get those memories, instill those memories in them at a young age that make them think sailing is the sport that I want to know, I want to love, I want to do for the rest of my life. Mark, thanks for that. I'm sure we'll come back to some of the detail on that later. And do remember that this is also being recorded and um, the previous two webinars that we've already run are available on YouTube. So you, you can go and look those up as well if you weren't on the live, uh, the live shows earlier. Um, so we're also pleased to welcome are three sailing club representatives who will talk about their particular club's initiatives. So uh, up north we have the head of training and the Commodore of Glossop Sailing Club, Vicky Packman. We have the Commodore of Graff and Water Sailing Club, John Aston, and with us in the room we have Hailing Island Sailing Club's Commodore, Nick Peters. So like, like last time, all three have prepared some slides and a presentation which they'll talk us through a little later. And also on the panel here in the room with us, we have an ex-sailor who fits into the age group that the research suggests could be among those who are most likely to want to participate in alternative forms of club activity. So introducing Hannah Cockle, who is in her 20s, used to sail out of a club, looking to get back into it, but would like to fit it into her lifestyle. So welcome to everyone, both here in the room with me and also um, to Vicky at Glossop and John and Grafham. Um, so first, let's get the ball rolling with a quick recap on some of the background to this webinar and the research that triggered it. So Liz Rushall, you were at the sharp end of this, so give us a summary of what that research was and what we learned. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to talk specifically about the research that sort of affects, I suppose, the theme for tonight. Um, and so I suppose it gives us some of the reasons why we're talking about adapting what we do and changing formats. So in the last webinar, I talked a little bit about some of the changes in younger generation from research from Sport England, where we, we talked about the whole concept that people are getting less interested in competition, they're less interested in formal training and organised sports, and there's this whole move towards personal challenges and experiences. Um, so that was really where we got to with the last seminar, and um, and just from that, if that's affecting young gen generations, immediately that sort of suggests that you might be thinking about changing what we do just in the light of that little bit of research. So moving on, there's some additional um, stuff we found from Nielsen, uh, a big sports research agency, which is talking about the change in attention spans, and as a result of that, other sports are beginning to adapt. And I'm sure some of you already sort of relate to the fact that people are sort of intensely interested in, in some less stuff, but generally interested in doing a lot more things. Um, 
And sports, I just mentioned, are revolving. You'll be aware, and probably sure, of things like rush hockey. Um, there's things like fast five netball. All sorts of things happening in Australia with fast four tennis, which Federer has launched recently. Um, so lots of different activities, and mainly they're looking at shorter formats, responding to the fact that people have less time. And then other activities that are happening are things like um, sports like football and badminton, introducing walking versions for different generations. So older generations can participate for longer. And we'll be, I'm sure many are aware of things like touch rugby, initially introduced for younger people for a lower contact type sport, which is now appealing to adults as well. So we've got the example of a number of other sports already adapting in the light of social changes. Jumping back to some of the pieces from Sport England, um, I think this is really important and what uh, sort of drew my attention to this part of the research was how it really could relate to sailing and give us an opportunity. Because here they were talking about how younger people are really keen to interact. They want to share experiences and they want to create memories. And that obviously appeals to the social media generation too. They want things that are spontaneous, quick to organize, and appealing and interesting settings. And if you think about interesting settings, well, we're lucky with the boating and, and sailing that generally you can argue that we're generally in very, very nice settings in the first place. So that's a great opportunity for us. They're also looking for activities that enable quality time. And they're looking for lifestyle activities. Now, here again is a really interesting trend. The activities that offer practical or ideological alternatives to mainstream sport. Now, we know that sailing and boating is a niche activity. There is no way that we're a mainstream sport. So that, I think, is an opportunity for, for many of our clubs to sort of to latch on to that. And then finally, the whole business about connecting and social connection, whether it's drinking, shopping, um, drinking, uh, sort of whatever, eating, we have got to say, sailing does allow us to do all of the above. So jumping forwards, again, in one of the earlier seminars, uh, webinars, we talked about the, the need for adapting formats. And I think in the light of what Sport England is saying, you can sort of see that it's about having different formats and presenting them at the right time and the right place. So I think, you know, there's questions around what's suitable for adults, what's suitable for very young children, what's suitable for people as they're learning. And, you know, whether it's right to be doing competitive stuff very early on, it just has to come into the mix and the consideration when you're planning what you offer within your club. And then just lastly, to, to wrap up, there's formats to think about, there's the generations to think about as to what's right for them, there's offering multi-sports and activities, which we'll certainly hear more on later, and there's even things like buildings and your assets at your club that you can use for other activities. And I just want to finish before we hear from the clubs on a very, very quick case study. Bristol Corinthian Yacht Club is a fairly typical uh, inland club facing as dropping membership, facing issues of getting enough volunteers. Um, they went for a completely new strategy and introduced paddleboarding, which has certainly helped. But in the process of making that strategic change and introducing paddleboarding, they realized that their name as a, as a club didn't fit what they did. And certainly yacht club didn't reflect what they did because they didn't have any yachts. So what they've done is introduce a name change for the organization and under the banner of Cheddar Wolf Sports, embrace sort of kayaking, windsurfing, sailing, paddleboarding within their name. And yet having a core and existing membership of dinghy racers, it was very important to keep the Corinthian part of their name. So it is home of the Bristol Corinthian Yacht Club at Cheddar Water Sports. A very smart way of adapting for the future and bringing in, and I think the important thing is that the change has helped them bring in new members from the community who wouldn't otherwise have come to their door. So without further ado, thank you, Andy. Liz, thank you very much. So interesting to hear that Bristol Corinthian already going down that track. Um, with the, the kind of ideas that the research threw up, um, how, what kind of uptake do you think we're seeing so far amongst the clubs and sailing centres around the country? I think having come back from some of the club conferences recently, we're seeing a complete mix. There's a, there's a number of clubs who are already going down the path trying new activities. There's quite a few who are on the cusp of, of doing something new, they're not quite taking the leap yet, and some that aren't there yet. So I think it's really exciting times at the moment. 
Well, Liz, thank you very much for that. Now, throughout the webinar, we'll be running several online polls to get feedback from you, the clubs and the sailors out there, and running the poll will be Alistair and Mark. Uh, so guys, just talk us through that process. Yeah, so like last time, we've got a number of preloaded questions uh, within the system. So we can select one, we'll send it out, um, and attendees on the other end will see a box, it'll be a multiple choice, just select your answer. We'll have a few minutes to sort of analyze the results uh, and we'll let you know. So it's really instantaneous and, and, and useful for us to see. And it's getting this feedback from you that is really going to help us learn more as to what we do in the future and how the directions are going and what clubs are implementing. So we'll just kick off with the first question. So this one's, have you tried hosting an alternative activity at your club? Um, you're about to see it should launch now. Um, so in front of you, you should see the answers. Um, please go, go ahead and, and, and start to answer those and, and we'll let you know what the results are shortly. Lovely, okay, so uh, moving on, let's hear now from the first of our case studies. So let's start with Vicky Packman, training principal and Commodore of Glossop Sailing Club. Vicky, thanks for joining us and let's, let's just check that the, uh, the, the pipeline between right. Southampton and Glossop is working. Can you hear us okay, Vicky? I can, I can hear you very well. Yes, I can hear you. Hello, Alistair. Hello. Hi there. Hello. So, um, so Vicky, Andy here, you've really managed to integrate a completely different form of activity in, into your club in the form of paddle boarding. So tell us how you've yeah. managed that. Okay, okay. I'll start with my slides now, if that's all right. Yeah. Do you want me to start with my yeah, slides and my first slide? Can you see the first slide? No, Vicky, if you, should you, if you just make yourself presenter. Uh, there we are. How about that? Perfect. Yeah, there we are. There we are. Good. Go. This is me learning as well. So, um, I'm, uh, as I say, I'm from Glossop Sailing Club, and just a word about our venue. It's a Pennine Reservoir at 650 feet between Manchester and Sheffield. On that picture you can see that's the Pennine Way going over our dam. So it's a high wind rural location, uh, member run club, it's a small family club and of our 225 members we've got about 75 full and family members and of course they're the ones that do duties, do things. So we, um, in the spring of 2018, we introduced stand-up paddleboarding. It came out of we've done a, a club development plan for five years with our aim of more members, more activities, more time on the water. Liz mentioned earlier beautiful locations. That's what we have and we felt we wanted it used much more often. And we did that via RYA Insights, look at other webinars, uh, SWOT analysis, and we had long discussions, uh, good discussions in our executive and talked about how this would integrate. One of the things that we did was set up a SUP etiquette guide for all water users to help existing dinghy sailors and windsurfers know how stand-up paddleboards operate, to help stand-up paddleboarders know what to expect from dinghy sailors and windsurfers. So we bought five stand-up paddleboards for club hire after people had completed a course. And we bought in an ASI qualified instructor because we're an RYA training center. This was new for us and uh, we wanted to have expertise and to do it properly. Initially, we set up uh, female only courses because we consciously wanted to bring in more women who were enjoying time on the water rather than around at the club and on the shore or in the galley. There are many, many women who we're not just benefiting from the, the beautiful water that we have. We promoted in social media. It's been so successful in what we have now. The uh, SUP members have their own WhatsApp group to make arrangements to meet each other. It became the talk of the town. We have feedback from people who'd never been anywhere near our sailing club, who'd all heard about it and wanted to come and try. We had family members of existing dinghy windsurfing junior members we also had a lot of new members who'd never been sailing or windsurfing and were very clear they didn't want to do that, but were excited by SUP. We only started it in May and by October, we'd, we'd had about five 
paddling members, a small number of kayakers who'd just come, we'd not done any activity, we'd increase that to 25 active paddling members. But within that as well, there's women who were hidden or invisible because they were the partners or parents of existing members. So it's, it's getting them using this great facility. Um, it has increased female membership, has it? It's increased female activity on the water. But they've already started contributing to club life and we've talked to them about contributing with duties and offering them opportunities to train and build up their skills. Some, a small number, have uh, uh, completed start sailing and start windsurfing courses. And we were really pleased at our uh, prize giving last year. We were able to celebrate um, our suppers. We measured what we did because in our plan, our uh, uh, development plan, we knew we would be measuring things like membership numbers, duty volunteer, inclusive membership, wider offer. We actually had a strong cash flow, but we didn't start off with that initially, but we will keep planning on what we're doing. And I have three um, key learning points that I would want to share with people. SUP is valuable in its own right. We initially saw this as a gateway to dinghy sailing, windsurfing, thinking that people would come and they'd immediately want to do a windsurfing or a, a dinghy course. Now it's a third pillar of club activities because it's this activity. We now have whole families on the water. We have many examples where one parent was dinghy sailing um, and one child dinghy or windsurfing or both. Now we have the other parents up so whole families can enjoy being up at the club and more members are now buying uh, their own SUPs. Two other key learning points on my last slide. Um, commitment by the executive. There was an entirely reasonable concern that we are a sailing club, it's about wind hitting a sail. Is this different from what we do? And it's a really fair point. And we did some thinking and talking and um, uh, looking at how we could integrate it. I talked about the SUP etiquette, but we communicated with members and potential members. We had a pathway for post-course, so there were steps to hire. We had a day with one of our, one of our um, very experienced ex-Olympic um, sailors in our club who offered a free day to any club members to come and try it, what this is all about. And it's now running alongside club session. And the third one, it's a new area of expertise. We bought in qualified instructor time. We didn't want to do it at, in, in some uh, not quality way. So, and it also wasn't an additional demand on club volunteers. And uh, for us, it's been an, a success and we're already looking at where we go next year, what opportunities, how we build on what we have done. So um, it's been a, a really good story for us. Vicky, thank you very much. A very inspiring presentation and uh, beautifully laid out in terms of uh, what some of the concerns were and how you addressed some of them. Um, I'm yes. just going to throw a question to uh, to Alistair. Um, what Glossop have done here, Alistair, um, as far as you know, um, how, how unique or uh, how many other clubs have tried something similar? Yeah, well, actually, I think it's um, very much reflected in the answers of the poll we've, we, we've just received. So I'll just quickly run through that. Um, We've actually had 43% um, of people who voted come back and said, and said they haven't yet introduced an alternative activity but plan to. 13% have said yes, um, SUP. 29% uh, yes, other, uh, and 9% not going to. And I suppose from our experience of, of going around the affiliate club conferences and speaking to clubs, I think Glossop aren't alone to, to have introduced stand-up paddleboarding or alternative activity. But I think the way that Glossop really integrated this within um, the club, and it's not sort of two activities or two separate clubs, if you like, um, within one facility, is quite unique. And, and I think they've done a fantastic um, job. But I think a lot of sailing clubs have a sort of gig rowing section or you know perhaps a dive section that sort of run out of, of the facility. But I think, um, yeah, the, the fact that Glossop really integrated it within the club means that the chances of, of these stand-up paddle boarders transferring over to sailing is, is much higher. Thanks, Alistair. Um, a, a question for Hannah Cockle. Hi, Hannah. Hi. And thanks for joining us this evening. 
Um, so what are your impressions of what Glossop have done and, and um, how much would it convince you to come to the club compared with if it was just a pure sailing club? Yeah, I think it works really, really well and certainly amongst my friendship group, we don't, nobody does just one activity. Nobody says, yes, I'm a sailor or I'm a windsurfer or I'm a runner and that's all I do. We all like to do a mixture of different activities. So if there was somewhere where we could go and be together and do a number of different things, it would make so much sense. Thank you. Um, Vicky, um, what were the reasons for going the women only route for the, getting into supping? Um, um, how much resistance, if any, was there to that idea? And what would you say to, uh, to other clubs considering going down this route? Okay. It came out of our um, analysis that we did for our club development plan, where we'd identified that women were underrepresented on the water. And uh, we looked at uh, national research from Sport England and other RYA webinars and, and looked at what uh, learned that stand up paddleboarding was uh, uh, one of the fastest growing water sports in the country. And, and looking at what we learned from Sport England about what the feedback is that what women said about their participation in sport. We were very consciously wanting to have more women participate on water. Um, initially, the, uh, there were just one or two comments about people perceiving it as, is this discriminatory? And when we explained to them that we were starting in this way, and in fact we moved on to offer some whole family sessions and some mixed sessions, people were happy with that. Um, and then understood that what we wanted to do was get a core group of women doing uh, several of the courses together to build up this critical mass and the stand-up paddleboarding group. So communication and explanation uh, did help us very much. Um, and what concerns were there about uh, maybe something detracting from sailing from people who were very, we're all sitting around the table here are very much into sailing um, above all else but uh, how much was the supping seen as a threat how much as an opportunity um, I, th I think one of the concerns was in terms of time and energy the volunteers that we have are already stretched and that's true and would it be a distraction of energy when really we were wanting to look at how we develop our junior club how we encourage juniors to start racing how all of those things we're doing as well, how we offer um, start sailing, start windsurfing and integrate those people into the club so that we are keeping uh, good strong numbers for those activities. So that was a, a real concern. And then secondly, about um, because we were running a lot of courses, how it would happen with people side by side. Well, we ran the, uh, the sub courses and nearly all, uh, many were on the Saturday, so they didn't cross paths with the uh, the races on a Sunday until people had done the course and had some skills when they could paddle uh, and, and would take note of where the dinghy races were going. And then we did run some um, uh, sub courses on a Wednesday night where we have a, a Wednesday night a quick race. It's, uh, it's, it's an easier, um, it's not as busy on a Wednesday night. And they managed to uh, work side by side. It's a very large amount of water and, and they found that very helpful. I think it was also the doing. Once you do and people start and people uh, start learning and then uh, are able to talk to each other about how they'll uh, work together with sharing the launching area which isn't very big at Glossop. Lots of water but not much launching area. So just learning how we manage each other, what the expectations were for safety boats, all of those type of things, they, they were people's absolutely reasonable concerns wanting to get it right. Vicky, thank you very much and you touch on an interesting point there that um, in the end what, what is the harm in experimenting and trying new things and, and mm -hmm. clearly you, you've done that and it seems like from the, the first season it's working very well for you. Alistair, yeah. I believe um, it's poll time again. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to hand over to Mark who's going to introduce the, uh, the next poll. Well, it is the question, do you think that sailing clubs should cater for more than just sailing? Or is it just, we should just only have sailing at our clubs? And so here we've got the different options. Yes, definitely, possibly, but sailing should come first. Thirdly, you're just not sure, or no, a sailing club is for sailors only. 
So we'll just have to we'll just leave this open for a couple of minutes. Just collecting results. We've got 43, 48% voted. It's great to see everybody voting so quickly on these. It's um, the information that we get back from you really is incredibly useful. So, um, how are we doing on time, yeah, Alistair? So I think we should. Well, we've just got so we we've we've got fifty four percent saying yes, definitely, forty three percent saying possibly, but sailing should come first, four percent saying not sure, uh, and zero percent saying no, sailing club. Is, is, is just a club for sailors. Right, well, Vicky, thank you very much for that. Um, we're now gonna move a little bit further south down to Grafham Water Sailing Club, uh, where we have Commodore John Aston waiting on the line. Uh, so John, can you hear us? And John, just uh, check in with us. Let's see if we can um, hear you coming through. Unmuted. Yes. John, are you unmuted? Just uh, check that you've unmuted your microphone. And now I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thanks very much, John. <laughs> yeah, that makes a difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got you here for your sailing expertise and your knowledge of Graf and Water Sailing Club. Um, so uh, I understand you've used a number of different initiatives to engage those who are perhaps less confident at sailing. So can you tell us about some of those? Yes, I can. And, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as Andy said, I'm John Aston. I'm Commodore of Graffin Water Sailing Club. Many of you will be familiar with us. Um, we're a large inland sailing club situated near Huntingdon, just off the A1. Um, we're fortunate in having 1,600 acres of saleable water. And as I said, we're a large club. We've got about 1,300 members with 700 boats. We were founded just over 50 years ago in 1966 when the Anglian Water Reservoir was opened um, and the club is open seven days a week throughout the year. Um, many of us will know us, many of you will know us for our strong racing history and the bottom right picture on the slide will be um, a picture that many people would um, associate with Grafham. Um, I'm trying to move on to the next slide, but it's not actually working at the moment. Just try clicking the slide, John. Yep, there we go. Um, the challenge that we faced four or five years ago was that we'd seen a long period of declining membership, really since the turn of the century, and there was no obvious reason why that should be re reverse. We recognized that we needed to widen our appeal. Um, Grafham then, um, we didn't particularly offer much in the way of training. We offered leisure sailing, but it was very unstructured. We basically said to people, there's the lake, go out and sail if you want to. There was no organized pathway. Again, junior and youth sailing was um, unstructured. Um, we did have club racing and we did have, have open meetings, which historically, as I've said, were um, the club's strengths. So what did we do about this? Um, well, there were two things, essentially. We set up um, an RWA recognized training school in 2013, and we ran courses for both adults and youths. And we recognized around about the same time that we needed to establish a pathway uh, for people to take them through from all the way from complete novice to expert racer, rather than saying to people, um, as we hitherto had tended to do, well, if you can race, it's fine. And if you can't race, well, you're on your own, learn to race and then take part. Um, so we established three things in particular, a friendly Friday activity on Friday evenings, um, this girl can activity on Tuesday mornings and sociable Saturday. And sociable Saturday initially was um, informal racing on a Saturday afternoon. But over the period of two or three years, um, that's morphed and got busier into um, Grafham Saturdays as they are today. And from April to October, we have a whole variety of things going on on Saturdays. Um, in the mornings, we have taster sessions for people who are new to the club. We run sailing clinics, which are sort of one-on-one -on -one tuition. We have a club coaching session, which lasts for a couple of hours and led by our chief instructor. Um, we have an activity for our youngsters on Saturday afternoon, which we call Team Grafham, which is informal tuition. And we still have uh, 
where it all started we still have the sociable saturday informal racing on a saturday afternoon and then last year we introduced a um, introduction to windsurfing session as well as that from time to time we'll be running powerboat two courses um, we tend to run volunteer refresher days on a saturday we have new member meet and greet sessions um, about six times a year and of course there's still the um the open meetings which 14 about 14 or 15 times a year we'll have an open meeting on a saturday um, an essential ingredient in this is that our chief instructor is on site all day and he is involved in a number of these activities but i think with what we've achieved and i i don't think um, we necessarily um, planned this it would turn out this way when we um, tried to reinvigorate our saturday activity four or five years ago We've now got critical mass. These activities feed off each other. Um, there's a lot of sailing going on, but as importantly, there's a lot of social activity going on, going on as well, which helps um, bind the whole day together and make it a success. Thank you. Well, John, thank you. And so how have you found that all these changes have actually affected your membership numbers? Well, of course, Andy, it's difficult to establish whether one thing in particular has given rise to um, a particular result. What I can say is that we have reversed the membership decline and for the last four or five years um, we've seen modest increase in our membership numbers which obviously is extremely pleasing. Thanks John. I want to come back to you in a moment but Hannah I want to ask you a question about uh, someone who's currently a, a non-sailor and um, maybe sometimes sailing clubs are a little bit obsessed with the racing aspect and don't think about the the broader appeal of sailing um what's your view on the kind of um changes that grapham have made and how much would that convince you to uh, think about returning to sailing yeah i think the changes that grapham made would be really attractive to me i'm quite competitive though so i do like to do a bit of racing but actually it's becoming less and less time to socialize with my friends and, and do other things so actually getting together to do something out on the water like social Saturdays that was mentioned, that would certainly sort of sell the club to me much more than going down and, and racing all day and potentially not really talking to anybody. So yeah, it would certainly convince me. Thanks, Hannah. Um, John, another question for you. Um, I think one of the appeals of racing is that it's very measurable and it seems that um, things that humans can measure tend to be more interesting than things that they can't measure. Um, so, uh, what's your view on that? How do you make um, non-racing um, something that people feel that they're doing and that they're making some kind of progress at, if you think, if you agree with my premise that measurement is important in the first place, of course? Well, I, I, I partially agree with your premise. I think um, measurement is more important to some people than others. And I think um, our sort of Saturday offering reflects that um, if you want um, out and out hardcore racing you can still come along on Sundays and we still do that um, to the same level that we did it before but what the Saturday people seem to be interested in um, they have got their racing through the sociable Saturday activities on a Saturday afternoon um, but they're also interested in, in improvement and that's where the coaching the club coaching session comes in they will have their own individual um, objectives and they can try and satisfy those through um, taking part in the club coaching sessions. Um, the other thing that it strikes me is that certainly most of the people sitting around this table we all tend to come from racing backgrounds and, and is it that um, a large number of racing oriented people end up sitting on committees of sailing clubs and therefore only capable of thinking the same way that they think? Um, I think that was certainly the case with us. Um, our tradition had, had been as a very serious racing club and historically I think the club had maintained its membership by um, people wanting to come to get higher quality racing. I think um, what Sailing has found those a support is that, is that the, the racing population has declined and our membership was declining with it um, and we needed to um, think outside of our core offering to see what other things we could do to to help boost the membership. 
Well, congratulations on taking Grafram through that process and to everyone else who's been involved in that. And it sounds like uh, the rethink is working for you. And Mark Jardine, you're an active member at Keyhaven Yacht Club. Um, so can you tell us uh, what kind of activities have been going on, on there and how that compares with Grafham's experience? It's great to see the diversification of activities in Grafham. It very much, much reflects what's happening at Keyhaven Yacht Club. Um, we have scout cruising on various days of the week. Um, there's a women on water um, campaign, which gets more people out on the water that way. And what was so interesting is seeing the social aspects. And um, one of the things that was started last year was a kids' pizza and film night. And these happen throughout the winter. You get the kids to feel comfortable down at the club. And of course, the parents come down and use it for the social activities. And therefore, when they went out on the water later on, they all knew each other. They knew the club. And so that first barrier was broken down straight away. And it's that's the social aspects and again i really liked hearing about the critical mass if you get more people into the club the club instantly feels busy and then more people want to come down it doesn't affect the number of races if anything the racing has gone up as well it's just a case of more people are enjoying the club the diversification means that it's in use mark thank you very much and John, thanks very much to you. Um, we're going to move on to our third club. And um, our third club has done lots of things to improve racing participation. So Hailing Island Sailing Club is probably the biggest club we're going to hear from tonight. But despite the fact it has professional staff, it also has a strong volunteer ethos. So Nick Peters, you're the Commodore. You've been active in sailing for more years than you'd care to remember. What's been driving this experimentation? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Andy. Yes, indeed, I have been racing for as long as I can uh, remember and, um, and still regularly at Hailing, I'm pleased to say. Um, what, what's driving the sort of changes at Hailing are to uh, see a, a, a continued um, uh, participation it's part of a where we have a strong sort of strategic plan and part of that for Hailing Island Sailing Club is uh, participation uh, but a little bit about Hailing um, I mean we have a lot of you will remember us hopefully uh, you've been to championships and so on and hopefully there we have over 3,000 members uh, I guess to give that some historical uh, perspective the lowest membership in the last 15 to 20 years was about two and a half and the highest was 3,200 and I think we're about 3,100 at last check. So we're, we're, we're pretty healthy but we've had to run some open days and uh, so on and so forth. We've worked pretty hard. Uh, as you can see we're um, an established international championship venue and we hope to continue that. It's part of our heritage. Uh, but we're also particularly proud of the sort of vibrant community of members and, and we really do embrace an array of activity and I'd like to say although Hailing has this reputation for racing we, we have really embraced some of what uh, some of the sort of ethos I've heard from both Grafham and, and Glossop that, that they both very much echo the experiences we have so you know we do embrace um, paddleboarding in particular is particularly popular we feel or dinghy sailors feel it fits in particularly well with dinghy sailing because there's no wind uh, we go paddleboarding also if we're perhaps dinghy sailing on a saturday afternoon we might paddleboard in the morning we've introduced paddleboard racing uh, which is great fun I, I hasten to add there are more uh, women um, participating than men and i also hasten to add, add that i'm yet to finish in the top half um, despite realising that longer the paddleboard you have, the faster you go, and it's becoming a bit of an arms race, but it's not particularly helping me. Um, but anyway, um, as I say, going back, our key objective uh, really w with our strategic is to increase participation of our existing membership with a particular emphasis of this 18 to 40 age group, which I think all clubs understand that we tend to lose uh, a lot of members at 18 um, or in fact um, typically some of them I think leave a little bit earlier than that and frankly it's hard to get them back until 
they have children of their own uh, and I think sailing clubs have to work particularly hard I mean if you typically say you're in your early 30s you, you maybe you've got married you're thinking about buying a house you're thinking about putting down roots it's at that time that sailing as a sport has to work very hard to get those to get those people and to provide something provide a package that that could appeal to that um, sort of demographic so um, hailing to come up with uh, one or two innovative sailing formats uh, firstly looking at uh, optimizing uh, traditional formats uh, and then exploring some more sort of novel formats but firstly uh, on the traditional formats um, clearly we have a passionate group of of sailors that race uh, at, at hailing and I'm, I'm one of them I'm, I would like to say that sailing doesn't have to be super serious I mean we all laugh at ourselves you know if we go around the rock mark the wrong way or we capsize when we shouldn't have done you know despite the fact that race could be serious half the fleet could be you know it doesn't have to half the fleet could be laughing it doesn't have to be serious but pen and weekends for us reflect an open meeting style event so we have two days of solid racing perhaps uh, four races we do one a month. I don't really know why we call them penance, but we do one a month. We always do a band in the evening. In fact, we try to kind of reflect the sort of event that if you were going to, uh, you know, your class in land championship or something that you'd like to feel it was that kind of event. We've also introduced some years ago sprint Saturdays, we call them, because of our tidal challenges. We tend to hold them at high tide. Uh, they are class specific and we tend to say eight uh, as a minimum. So if a class provides eight, then we will provide five short windward lured races uh, and sprints that are usually followed by a, a social, which typically is uh, hosted by one of the clubs, uh, sorry, one of the classes. So for instance, the elite class might host a social on a sprint Saturday, and those, those tend to work quite well. I think that the social aspect of sailing, we've touched on it before, cannot be overemphasized. It's, it's utterly crucial. And on the remaining Saturday, Saturday handicaps are, you know, it's kind of, we put everyone in together, we run it on, a, on an average lap um, basis so that, so that the moth sailor and the solo sailor still get to the bar at the same time. They can argue, of course, about the fact that the wind probably increased as the race went on and so on. But the key thing there is an immediate prize giving. We, we work out the prizes there and then, and we, we hand out bottles and hopefully we make it a kind of instant, instant gratification, if you like. It's just a bit of fun on a Saturday afternoon. And that, I think, we're still kind of working on, but we've seen some good turnouts for that because it's... It's very non-serious, I think, perhaps because it's average lap. We can move on. Then we have, um, in Chichester Harbour, there's been a, a tradition of regattas, and uh, those have been, um, uh, unfortunately, they've been declining rapidly over the years. And at, at HISC, we tackled it by coming up with something called the Whitson Regatta, which I think, if I'm honest, we stole. Uh, from Burnham um, and uh, the idea there is that our Whitson Regatta basically copies uh, Regatta Week or what, oh, sorry, Race Week or what used to be called Chichester Harbour Federation Week and it's really a kind of weekend of festing, festive racing. Yes, we're targeting serious races but yes, we throw in some serious socials from the moment you hit the shore there's, there's beer on tap, there's a band every evening. So it's something we're working hard on. It's in development, some of the smaller classes, for instance, the Tazar class are choosing it to uh, run their championships at uh, this year. So we're quite excited about that and that's a three day event. Um, but in terms of more novel formats, again, it's on this racing theme. Um, and as I hasten to add, 
racing, you know, HISC is about more than racing, it is about a great community as well. But on the more novel formats, I think perhaps the most successful has been the Commodore's Trophy. We're lucky to have six identical uh, RS ventures. Uh, and the, the rules are three in every boat. Um, fancy dress is uh, thoroughly encouraged. Um, the racing is on a knockout basis. It lasts for a day. We have a commentary run constantly from the balcony and it is spectacularly successful. The balconies are absolutely grand. And the fancy dress prize is perhaps more important than the overall prize. <laughs> but in fact, the guys that win, win usually get, um, they usually have to buy everyone else a round of drinks. So there's usually an active, active um, effort to lose the race in the, in the final moments. Um, with regards to our alternative events, um, the, the round hailing race is something that, of course, has a massive history if any of us are long-term windsurfers. In fact, it started in the 70s. And for years and years, we lost, um, we lost traction on that, but we've reintroduced it for uh, windsurfers, SUPs, and uh, ocean, six-man ocean kayaks. And that's worked really, really well. So and we're, we're really going to build on that again. It's a very, very sociable, sociable weekend and uh, great fun. Um, I think that there are some other small ones that we found particularly successful, for instance, in the, the solo class, which is particularly popular at Haley. We have 70 of them. We have an average of 11 boats every time they go racing. Um, they introduced a year-long ranking, which was particularly successful. It is very hard fought. There's also a personal handicap trophy event, I think, again, that works well. Any club that has a strong class, I would suggest looking at personal handicaps. Um, the Elite is a, a race, is a, a keel boat class that's quite strong at Hayley. Um, we now like to run uh, two up, uh, two up events uh, with no spinnakers, and we have two or three of those a year. Lastly, very quickly, I'm running out of time. Thursday evenings for the cruisers, bang and return. So rather than race a J109 against a, a Cornish shrimper, they race for half an hour. Somebody bangs a gun and they turn around and they race home. The key thing is there. They're in the bar in time for a beer and the same time. Long live social sailing. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Peters, thank you very much. And the overriding theme there, again, is not being afraid to experiment and, and try new things. But I sometimes wonder with sailing club committees, maybe that's easier said than done. Um, how do you drive through change or at least um, open up the opportunity for experimentation within a committee-based structure? Well, they're in, they're, that's the perennial problem for any sailing club. I think I was lucky enough to pull along a, uh, a vice comm sailing who was also a keen dinghy sailor, and we have a sort of groundswell of opinion towards that. I think also, okay, the other thing is building from get-go, your sailing club needs a strategy. As soon as you have a five-year strategy, we use, we use the VMOST uh, structure, which was in introduced to us by uh, uh, our newest trustee, a chap called Rod Carr, who might have had some <laughs> of the other way in the past. And once you have a strategic strategy in place, any initiative that somebody comes up with, if it meets your strategic goals, any club has an any committee has an immediate mandate to take it through, and I think that helps. Wow, I'd love to find out more about the most uh, because I sometimes wonder if benign dictatorship is is the way to make change, even though that's not a very popular term these days in these strange sure. political times. Certainly, Rod is the most benign dictator that we've ever come across. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're running a little bit behind time. Um, so I'm going to quickly check in with our pollsters. Do we have time? to talk about polls, Mark and Alistair.
Well, it's really some some of the questions coming in. Uh, there have been a few people have been asked about asking about staffing for these kind of alternative events. But what I hear from a lot of the reports that come in to yachtsandyachting.com is that we we see as soon as you get events that engage the entire family and these alternative events, ones that have the festival atmosphere, the fun, the spectator um, aspects to it, people want to be involved. And so getting the volunteers is nowhere near as hard as when you need to get a rescue boat crew on a Sunday morning. And so if you involve the whole family in your events and make it so that they are enjoyable on and off the water, you will get the volunteers as well. Thank you very much. Hannah, can I check in with you? And based on the discussion and everything you've heard so far, can you give me a, a minimum one and maximum three of the things that have really jumped out at you? Um, I mean, in terms of getting you back into the sport, if you are any more interested in getting back into the sport than you were 45 minutes ago. <laughs> I think time is a big issue. So I certainly have less time, people have less time, so activities that can be done over a shorter amount of time and yeah offering something different so that people can do more than one activity i don't think there's any situation where that would be a bad thing i don't think you could say by just trying to introduce one other thing it would have a bad effect mm. so that the time thing and and i know that one of the previous webinars was was pay and play and nick you just touched on that um with the uh, the club boats that you've got this pay and play model as opposed to outright ownership of boats um, it, it seems to be a, a key one in getting those 18 to 40 year olds back into the sport doesn't it yeah uh, absolutely we uh, we're just going through the process of renewing our our hire fleet um, we're strongly considering buying uh, some RS 200s but at the moment the key boat for us I think is uh, that's getting people on the water and perhaps racing is a laser 2000 or the sorry the 2000 um we, and they are readily available second hand very cheaply so works and, well and the um you're not directly involved in rs sailing now you're one of the founder partners of rs sailing but the 2000 now owned by rs yes. is that correct yes it is yes and i know no i'm i was a founding director and i'm now no longer involved Right, right. That, so what is it about the, the 2000 that you think is ticking the boxes? Well, it's, uh, it's incredibly stable. It's very underpowered. And speaking from an RS perspective, it's a relatively low key sailboat. It's easily manageable. Uh, and the 200 would be ideal, but it is a little tricky. And we do have 60 200s at Hayley. And to add a few for the pay and play uh, would be great. But frankly, uh, the 2000 is an instantly more manageable boat and is also readily sailed around Chipster Harbour. And they're also incredibly cheap second hand, which is a good point for penniless clubs. OK, thanks for that, Nick. Um, now, we just have over five minutes left of this webinar. Um, so. Um, we will field any questions that, that have come in. Um, before we get, well, Alistair, how are we doing on questions? Are there any that we need to address? Um, I think Mark's um, just sort of addressed a, a number there, but I think it's probably a, a good time um, to, to, to re-engage another poll. Um, so just looking through, and very relevant to the Hailing Island case study that we just heard about, the question is, do you think mixing up race formats will encourage greater turnouts and re-engage perhaps members. So I'm just going to launch this now. Should come onto your screens very soon. So if you just spend a couple of minutes just collecting responses. Now, one of the interesting things here and quite a lot of the feedback is some of the questions we've had come in were uh, really comments about different activities that have been done at other clubs. And often they're not a race at all. We've got talking here about, questions that's gone off the top, but <laughs> go up to touch. Yeah, the, the Great River Time Adventure. 
And on that, it was any kind of craft that is either human powered or wind powered. And they had the biggest participation ever. And it, and it wasn't actually a race. So maybe it's not just mixing up race formats, it's mixing up everything that you do at the club. Brilliant, thanks Mark. So, so we've just got the results um, of the poll, so you can see it on the screens in front of you. Do you think mixing up race formats will encourage greater turnouts and re-engage LAPS members? 36% uh, say possibly, but serious racing is also important. 38% say yes, definitely. 22% not sure. 3% no, I don't think so. Hmm. So uh, pretty much an even split between yes, definitely, and possibly, but series, series racing is also important. Okay. Um, so Alistair Dixon, um, apart from running these webinars, what else is the RYA doing to address this area? Because looking at the success of the RYA and the, the, the headline stories that, that we know the RYA for, it's, it's winning Olympic medals. It's very much at the the sharp end of racing. That's certainly my perception of the RYA. Put me right on that and tell me how the RYA is addressing this broader question of, of making sailing less serious, maybe less racing oriented and more fun. So I think, um, you know, the sharp end and Olympic success is very much, you know, supported by a, um, a thriving, you know, club and, and training centre network. So it's in the interest of the sharp end to have um, you know mass participation um, what we're doing uh, you know as, as the RYA I, I, I suppose what we've heard tonight and, and similar to, to our discussions around the pain play there's no unfortunately silver bullet um, there are you know different solutions for different clubs uh, what we try to do especially through our affiliate club conferences is to get clubs together so they can sort of discuss best practice and learn from one another um, we've also this year um, put a, a, a number of other clubs, including Vicky presented tonight, up in front of you know their regions to talk about um, what they've done around this area. So it may be introducing new racing you know formats, it may be sailing activity, it may be you know completely different water sports, and that's been really successful. And I suppose that's helped um, clubs really understand how they can go about it, all the sort of administration management, such as insurance. Um, and booking systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so yeah, so it's 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 been really good. So our, our task really is to to sort of spread around best practice and just help you know clubs through this process. And you know, as Nick was saying, help them with strategic planning um, so they can sort of select the best options you know that fit what they're trying to achieve long term. We are running out of time. I just want to quickly throw open. The floor to anyone sitting around the table with me if there are any quick observations that anyone wants to make before I pass to Liz to uh, tell us where we're going next. So uh, anything that anyone wants to throw in? I suppose my, very quickly, uh, my biggest bugbear is, um, uh, is the greatest incentive for children and families to keep sailing is for parents to keep sailing and to involve the families and any kind of intergenerational activity. And it absolutely, as Glossop and, and uh, Grafham has described, it does not have to be racing orientated, but mm. involve the family and we're gonna get past go. That's a great point. And uh, you think about other sports like uh, football or rugby, where you pretty much have to give up your competitive career at about the age of 35 because the body starts breaking down let's forget or let's not forget let's remember that sailing is a sport for life and it's not just a motto it's something that we can really make the most of and I think you've touched on a really interesting point there Nick. Um, Liz uh, we've got another webinar coming up in January so uh, th this series continues tell us uh, where we're going next. Thanks, Andy. Well, Sport for Life is a, is a great introduction to that because the, the next theme that we're picking up on in January is the whole area of communications, marketing, and how we externally present ourselves, be it our club and the sport, and getting across the message about yeah, the fact that the sport is for life and there's things for everybody to come and do. So, so that'll be the topic for January. Um, and once again, we'll be uh, seeking some clubs or tapping a few people on the shoulder to come and get involved 
uh, in January session. Lovely, thank you. So in the meantime, please send us any further thoughts or feedback to the email which will be um, showing on this webinar. We'll also make the link to the recording available to view afterwards for those that weren't able to make it tonight. So finally, thanks to our guests um, from Vicky Packman, Commodore of Glossop, John Aston, Commodore of Bratham, Nick Peters here in the room, uh, Commodore of Hailing Island Sailing Club, and our resident 20-something, Hannah, thank you very much. Thanks to our panel, Alistair Dixon, Liz Russell, Mark Jardine, and thanks from me, Andy Rice. Um, so we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and that's good night from us. <laughs>